like, is OpenStreetMap act being taken seriously? I, I hope this is, reassures me. Um, my name is Mikkel Marin. I'm a Presidential Innovation Fellow at the uh, Department of State and working in the Humanitarian Information Unit on MapGive. And um, it's great to follow um, John and to proceed the next panel because it means there's lots of things I don't have to talk about when it comes to the use um, and engagement of OpenStreetMap in government. Um, also, uh, Kerry Stokes' presentation earlier on uh, geocenters and mapping for resilience and Arnold at the Department of Transportation. Um, there's lots I don't have to talk about, like legal issues and risk and identity, um, domestic U.S. use, and as, as John was talking about, the, prof the professional, uh, professionalization? That wasn't very professional. So what my talk is about and what I'm interested in is actually and what I've been spending the last nine months on and the final three months on in my fellowship is really looking at within government um, how, does, how do institutions adapt to working with the OpenStreetMap community, which is a very um, unusual animal to people who are used to working within large formal institutions. I'm proud to be part of a growing innovation movement in government, uh, just within the US uh, government. The Presidential Innovation Fellows is in its third round. We're, we're currently recruiting for the fourth round. Uh, you should apply if you're a, for, um, for any of these groups if you're interested in helping the government to do its job better through technology and user-centered design and open source. There's a group called 18F. Uh, which does a lot of, of great work of uh, providing services to other parts, uh, other agencies in the U.S. government, the U.S. Digital Service, and, um, and it's not just in the U.S. for sure. Uh, I just met Rodolfo from, uh, from uh, the Office of the President of Mexico. They have a, uh, an innovation unit uh, at the lab in, in France. Christian's here. And, of course, the U.K. Digital Service. There's a lot of people here in the U.S. and all over the world, and maybe in the U.N., as well, I guess John is in the UN now, so, um, who are really thinking about, well, how do, we, how do we help government to do better? And it's hard. Um, yes, bureaucracy is, is a real thing. Um, just to give you one example, uh, to get here to state of the map, um, I had to, uh, geez, submit a travel request. I had to submit another travel request when we decided to drive up rather than take the train, had to get permission from the PIF program and GSA uh, that to speak here, had to get permission from state because I have this dual role. Um, someone at some point decided that this was a training event, so we had to get permission to, do, to attend a training event. <laughs> and, oh, I ha yesterday we gave a presentation, uh, Tyler Radford is the interim ED of HOT and I, gave a presentation to some folks in the UN who were interested in learning about GIS. And that is actually like, like a foreign mission, essentially. So I had to get e-country clearance to do that. <laughs> it, and this is, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting to a degree, and it, it's not that big of a deal. You learn how to, to roll with it, but it does like eat up a lot of time, and it, and it does present a real drag on, on doing, doing work in the government. But the thing that really you know, gets, gets to me are, are silos. And um, whether we're working within uh, one government or within one agency, by, by the nature of who we are responsible for and who we have to answer to, it is very hard to work um, across with your colleagues who are doing similar, very similar work in, um, in other agencies. And I think OpenStreetMap represents the reason, one of the exciting reasons for OpenStreetMap and for HOT is that here's a space where no matter where you're coming from institutionally or no institution at all, you can work in the same place. So we actually do map together, but we don't, it's very hard to actually work together on all of the stuff that goes around mapping. And so that's something I've been interested in this year. Um, does anyone know the what that building on the, on the right is. It, it's, the, it's the headquarters of OpenStreetMap. 
that's if the OpenStreetMap Foundation's mailing address I, is is there, and one of our early board members uh, lives there. Um, it's on Google. You can find it. Like this is no PII here, but um, and of course that's a that's a different front door there. That's the first I think photograph in existence of the White House. And so being a government entity, um, you're used to being able to go to a front door. There's a physical presence. There is an entity that is relatable um, that you can, you can knock on the door. And OpenStreetMap is not like that, as we know. It's a very different kind of organization. And it's not disorganized. It's often, I do talk a lot about, I do fight against the word crowdsourcing a lot because there is this, this, impl this like implication that we are just, it just all kind of magically happens, right? Um, and well, here I, I think many of you are represented in this picture from the, the group photo last year at State of the Map US. But it's really, and we have excellent data, but none of it works unless we really care about it. And that's also something which is kind of, as, as Tom was talking about with the, with the Arnold Project, passion in your work in the government doesn't always, those aren't always coming naturally. But what makes this work, what makes OpenStreetMap work, I think, is that you have this commons that both individuals and institutions can engage with for a time, and then if they have institutional pressures or something else becomes a priority, they can leave. We've seen companies, we've seen governments ebb and, ebb and flow in their involvement in, in the OpenStreetMap community. And um, OpenStreetMap still persists because there's something which isn't dependent on any individual institution. But that institutional presence, I think, is actually, whether it's government, whether it's business, whether it's academic, is, is critical. Um, and this is, this is just some of the logos of some of the, I hope that's okay, Carry that is the USAID logo. Um, uh, some, of the, some of the entities which, uh, just in DC, make use of, of OpenStreetMap. Open Cities is a, the World Bank Global Facility for Disaster Risk Reduction. There's other parts of the World Bank which make use of OpenStreetMap. Missing Maps, of course. The American Red Cross, British Red Cross, HOT, MSF. MapGive, which is a project I work on. Peace Corps, Courtney will talk tomorrow. And then, um, you know, NP Maps and National Park Service, USGS, Department of Transportation, um, and others. And the thing is, like, you see these logos here. They're actually here as well. Um, I'm just curious if we could do it. Who, who here, and it's part of their work, as part of their job, is does stuff with OpenStreetMap. Like, you get paid to do OpenStreetMap stuff. Like, look, around, that's, I would say, like, 40, 35, 40, a third to 40 percent. How many people would like to? <laughs> <laughs> and, how, and how many people would not like to get paid ever to do anything to do with OpenStreetMap? Okay, that, see, that's telling. I think there's, there's an evolution of, of, of the community where it's actually part of our passion, but a part of our responsibilities to keep this thing going. And that's, like I said, it's, it's delicate because you, just like the OpenStreetMap Foundation says that it supports but doesn't control the OpenStreetMap project, you have to take that same position as an institution and rely on something which you ultimately don't have control of. It's beyond crowdsourcing, it's a commons, um, and, and hope that it, that it works. And that's a lot to bank the, the, it's a lot of risk to take as an institution. So MapGive is part of the Humanitarian Information Unit in the State Department, which uh, does lots of different things. You can meet some of the team who are here to learn more. Um, and as John was, was talking about, imagery to the crowd was sort of the, the entry point for the group to getting involved with the OpenStreetMap community, addressing gaps in imagery, whether it's in Bing and, and Mapbox and other partners, or whether it's after event imagery. And that's been going for a couple years now. And that has meant one way that I've seen that sort of uh, uh, maybe change the office a bit is that we are part of discussions of imagery uh, along with private sector partners and other entities of what are, the, what, are the, what are the imagery needs in times of crisis and who's going to do what. There's actually a, nego you know, a, a cooperation and negotiation which happens among all of the entities which are supporting OpenStreetMap and HOT times of crisis to figure out the best way to, to serve up imagery. Nepal was a great example of that. And, um, and of course, 
Digital Globe then uh, re released everything, which was fantastic, but then there was other questions which we had to work through about, well, how do we get this, how do we sort through this, how do we get it hosted so it can be effectively used by the OpenStreetMap community. So that's been a big part of, I think, of um, making the barrier with the government and the OpenStreetMap community a little more permeable. And MapGive launched about a year ago. Um, Josh spoke about it last year. And this is really um, the program around public diplomacy uh, with OpenStreetMap. The idea being that this is such an excellent community to engage with. It is such a big world. There are so many people that um, US government, State Department can, can work with the OpenStreetMap community um, and build up, help to support the creation of new communities in new places, and I'll show a couple examples, um, as part of its, its outreach work to, to American citizens and citizens of the world. Public diplomacy. And that sometimes looks like this. Um, the um, image on the left is, a, is one of the um, ICRC maps from the Ebola response. And the image on the right are young Palestinian women mapping for Ebola. Um, this is uh, kind of spearheaded by a NGO called Suktel in Palestine, which we had, our office had some discussions with and we shared our resources uh, through MapGive. Um, they also had a relationship with the Jerusalem Consulate who supported like a venue bringing together students. They taught them how to do OpenStreetMap and they mapped for the Ebola response. This kind of, this is not the usual story you hear about these two places. Um, but the amazing thing about OpenStreetMap are the kind of unexpected connections which can be made when we all work together. And this is, this is hot off the press. Uh, in Lahore, Pakistan, on Thursday, uh, the US uh, consulate there uh, worked with a local university and um, they mapped for Nepal. And very enthusiastically, it seems like there is now a, from that one engagement, a group which is ready to do more both for international humanitarian response and in Pakistan. And um, the guy who is on the far right actually is uh, we'll like to, he's a former Google Map Maker editor, who's uh, who's reformed and can <laughs> can speak to the you know the the non-proprietary nature of OpenStreetMap being like the, the key driver to him getting involved. Um, and this is we've also gotten involved in lots of ways with uh, with events are a big are a lot of what we do. We actually should be doing less events, um, but in November we worked with National Geographic and actually with USAID and with others who are, are, are part of this community and um, Geography Awareness Week was a big, a big push to also get the word out. Here's another example. Um, YALI is the Young African Leaders Initiative um, and these are, there's a group of, of uh, fellows across Africa, the Mandela Washington fellows who um, uh, are, very, are, are, rep, are from all over Africa. They're, they're highly skilled, they're leaders in their communities and there's a number of like engagements with them um, including conferences and these sort of intense connect camps which another office at the State Department works on, uh, education and cultural affairs. And we worked with them to, to introduce a, ma a map give component which is very lightweight. It's basically, you can see my, my big head there on a screen in um, uh, N Namibia, and just to spread the idea of, of OpenStreetMap and then follow up and provide support to them if they want to bring this into the projects they're working on. And not everybody is, is, uh, is into it, but you know, one or two or three out of each of these Connect Camps, there's a series, have seen, this is gonna be really valuable to the work that I'm doing back in my community. And um, the MapGive site itself, this is the Italian version, uh, which was translated, yay. Um, thank you. Uh, we, we're gonna translate into other languages um, as well, um, but I think the site was really well designed as an introductor, introduction to getting involved and we've seen it, I've seen it used all over the place as just a way of, uh, if you're at a mapathon, a mapping party, 
what is this all about, how do you get newcomers on board. So it's a great, it's a great resource. And it's part of the goal of my year is really to take all of this, this package of things and do map given a box, or I think Josh called it map given a can, which is kind of, um, so that embassies and consulates can, can really run with it themselves when they see that there's an opportunity to work with a local partner. Um, they have all the tools ready to go to do this kind of, kind of work. And beyond just doing mapathons, um, also working on the ground. And this is something I'm still trying to figure out what this will look like in the next three months. Um, I would be very happy to hear some ideas uh, about that. I know it's a very short time. Um, and it would be very interesting to um, connect that to the next state of the map, Latin America, which is in Santiago de Chile in September. So maybe we'll be able to share something there if we're, we do end up working in the region. So yeah, back to silos. Those are all the silos in OpenStreetMap connected. And um, you know, we, there's, there's folks, um, many of whom are here, Peace Corps, Red Cross, USAID, uh, World Bank, mainly in DC, we all kind of, you know, we know each other, we get together, we share, but it, um, I felt, I think we all felt that there was more we could do together. We're all working on the map together, but all of that stuff behind the scenes that we need to do to get OpenStreetMap institutionalized um, wasn't happening in a common place either. So the very creatively named OSM Institutions, which is simply a mailing list and a group of people who get together, if you have a better name, please let me know, uh, who get together every once in a while to work together. And we don't just come together to talk, that happens a lot in government where you have meetings and you talk about something you might do later or you talk about talking. Let's talk, we'll, we'll talk about this another time. But we actually get together, open laptops um, and do work together. And that is, feels very good. Um, some of the things we've been working on, um, we tried to identify where are the common gaps in our work and what can we contribute which would also have value to the broader community. Um, so tracing guides is one thing we're, we're starting on, which are uh, easy to put together, um, easy to read and usable guides explaining how to map things which you might not be familiar with from your everyday mapping, if it's especially through like the tasking manager and hot projects. So this is a, a tracing guide for Nepal and, and particularly um, IDP camps, uh, which, which Tom Gerton in my office worked on. Um, strategic communications is a, is a big deal. Um, for us to make the case within the, insti the institution, really, and to help folks understand well, how is this important to my work. I think Tom, in the last pre in the presentation on Arnold, was talking about like, engineers are just trying to—they're just trying to build roads. Like, what is it? What does all of this data matter to them? And um, I think a lot of it has to do with really clearly articulating to someone who has a need why they need the kind of thing that we do in OpenStreetMap. So we started with, uh, with just collecting case studies of examples of institutions who have, have um, demonstrated that. Uh, and we've also gotten, in, several of us gotten involved in Teach OSM. There's a Teach OSM workshop on Monday, um, which is about bringing OpenStreetMap into the classroom. And many of us, we've heard this I think a few times from Carrie and actually um, in the questions uh, during the Arnold talk. University students, I mean, the. The amazing thing about working with OpenStreetMap as university students, uh, particularly at GWU, who are like the, the, the real leaders in this, is that they're working on something real. They're actually contributing to something as part of their, their education. And, and no, it's not like an either or with, with learning ArcMap. It's learning something new, which is, I think, increasingly going to be part of, of people's jobs. So this is a set of curriculum to really make it easier for teachers to get OpenStreetMap. And we've been working on metrics um, to better understand what's been happening with OpenStreetMap data, get a clearer picture. And there's several talks about that at the conference. Um, and events, we've, been hold we've collaborated on quite a few events. This is um, from the map off, which was uh, GWU and Texas Tech versus George Mason University, which is the other <laughs> mapping university in, in uh, the DC area. 
and um, they went head to head um, to see uh, how many features they could, and they, they, they mapped a lot, um, and they, I think, triggered uh, some of the rate limiting on the OpenStreetMap API. Um, sorry, sorry, Tom, um, Grant. Um, and other events, uh, recently we had the, the first, I hope, uh, White House Mapathon, um, which uh, brought together the most people in suits to edit an OpenStreetMap ever. <laughs> um, Many of us were, uh, were there, um, and it's, I mean, the thing about it is it's a very tough environment to, to kind of break loose a little bit. It's very, like, it's impressive. It was, it was in the building next door, the uh, old, the old uh, executive building, but it's, it's a tough environment to, like, feel relaxed. It feels important, um, um, but uh, folks like Megan Smith, the CTO, she really warmed up the group. Um, and of course, having map cakes are essential. We've, I guess, kind of switched to doing uh, pops, and those are globe pops. Not very geographically accurate, but we are still happy with the atmosphere that it created of, we are, ha we are here not only to learn about something, but to have fun doing it, and this is still like the magic of OpenStreetMap that we can have fun digitizing and surveying. And we get together to learn. Um, we're, we, we're trying to improve, and so we're very deliberately having after-action after meetings and trying to deduce our lessons learned to improve our best practices. It would be great to expand the group. We're very DC-based right now, and um, that's not by intention. That is just by the nature of where we are. So if anyone is sort of like in an institutional role, doesn't even not necessarily government, who thinks that we share like common challenges and could do stuff together, it would be great to, to broaden the group. One way that I think may be an avenue to do, doing that is through things, uh, international, uh, uh, things like, like the Open Government Partnership, which is a voluntary commitment that 70 or 80 nations have signed up to demonstrate that they are improving government practice through open, in, all, in, in every shade of that. And, and open, open data is only a small part of open government, and OpenStreetMap is a very, very, very tiny part of, of uh, the OGP. Um, each nation has to put together a national action plan. Um, this is a quote from the second open government national action plan uh, for the US. Promote innovation through collaboration and harness the ingenuity of the American public. Beneath that are several like things about crowdsourcing. And while that seems very kind of high level in policy, um, it's really, I'm still trying to make the connection with how that actu actualizes into um, tangible work. It provides um, something that we can reference when we are trying to do work with OpenStreetMap as something which is important to the government. And that actually does get people listening when, they, when it, uh, you have a high level um, kind of backing what, what you do. So looking for those kind of opportunities is important. Um, somewhat related but different from OGP, the Open Government Plan and Department of State also highlights um, imagery to the crowd and MapGive as um, flagship projects. And this also is really helpful. So um, this is something I've learned a lot. Like what is, why, do you, why is it important to be in that policy document and why is it, you know, getting that phrasing exactly right? Because it allows you to do the things that you, you hope to get done. And um, this is also happening within the UN. The Sustainable Development Goals are going to be hopefully agreed to in, in some, some months from now. And there's a lot of interest in data and innovation with data. And it's very, very high level. And um, some of us were at the International Open Data Conference um, last week. And there is definitely a gap between people who are envisioning what, you know, that there's a need for innovation and actually understanding what that looks like in practice. So I think OpenStreetMap, our community has a lot of examples and can think of a lot more ideas of how um, we can present real projects which fulfill these high level policy goals. It's, it's, a, it's a different world and we need to, we need to connect. Um, I think MapGive is, is, is one model for that and I'd lo love to promote that more. It doesn't mean that like, there'll be map gives everywhere. Like, 
branding is important. Everyone needs to have, have a brand, but um, that this kind of engagement is something that even other governments could get involved with. Um, and I think supporting, critical is actually identifying these kind of organizations which can fill that middle role of connecting with the higher level international um, and national policy worlds and needs of people who are working at that level and, on, and needs on the ground. Um, where there's always this mythical you know, community mapper. Some of us are that mythical, five minutes, thank you. Um, mythical folks um, who exist, but in order to make, in order to make that connection, I, th I think we've seen very good examples of when there's an intermediary institution which understands both the on the ground needs and the needs at the international open data, open government, international humanitarian response levels and can translate between the two. Um, you see a, a picture there of the outdoor situation room of Kathmandu Living Labs. I think they're, they're a great example of that. Um, you see on the left a, a, a screenshot of the um, Open Schools Kenya map, which was put together by, by Map Kibera, showing this map actually after they collected all of the schools in, um, in Kibera. Uh, there were some demolitions along the railway line in the slum, and this map actually makes use of the data that, which was collected by the team, which bridges both the community um, and, and the global space. Okay, so I have five minutes left, quick lessons, and then maybe a couple questions. Um, how to put this? Uh, when I entered government in September, I was surprised suddenly at the kind of conversations I was having with people that I'd, oh, I knew before, but we were talking at like a whole different level. Like within a week, um, there's a trust that goes along with being part of the club. And, um, and there's reasons for that, but it's important to understand that you, you know, that's, um, uh, that's why it's important for folks like us to find our ways into places which want to make change. That's why pro fellowship programs like, like the PIF pro program, Code for America, and others um, to, to break down that barrier a little bit. Um, I meant, mentioned this, getting together and working together is really, um, is, feels really good um, in government. So find opportunities to do that. Um, as a fellow, or at least, you, you get a little bit of a free pass to make mistakes and go places you're not supposed to go and do things you're not supposed to do. So if you ever have the opportunity to do that, really do it. Um, don't, uh, don't be afraid to take risks when um, you, can, you have an excuse of like, oh, I'm just the new guy. Um, there will be things that you want to change, for sure. Um, and you can try to construct arguments for why they should be different. I find it much more effective to just pretend that it already works in a different way and start doing things that way. Um, uh, our office uh, over the past year started using GitHub for issue tracking and it uses Trello for, for project management and I think that was kind of like a somewhat conscious decision on my mind. It's like, I'm just gonna do it and I'm not gonna try to like write a, you know, a, multiple page paper explaining why that's strategic. And really love, uh, love the process. I find it really fascinating understanding how, trying to understand how government works. I've, I've probably only scratched the surface, um, but if you take that as kind of an anthropological um, approach, it's, it's fascinating. And um, within, like, within all the, the policy frameworks I was, I was talking about, there really is a hung hunger for real stuff and real demonstration that that policy translated into something. So take advantage of that um, and promote what you're doing um, and try to connect it to um, goals that are kind of a little bit more abstract level. I'll, I have like one and a half minutes. Any, any questions, please? Well, one point is that it doesn't need to be a single institution. That's the OpenStreetMap Foundation, and usually that's like the first point. I think the, the foundation can certainly um, adapt, and I don't know if Kate 
when I'm sure Kate Chapman has a talk about the OpenStreetMap Foundation. I think that would be a really good one to attend to think through, well, is there a greater role for the foundation or not? Um, but remember, there's lots of institutions. So HOT, for example, is another organization which is, um, you know, has a bigger budget and is more formalized than the foundation. And um, at what point does that require something more at the center is a, is a good question. But it's, it's definitely never going to rely on a single institution. Maybe one more question? Or not? Oh, Carrie. Berking, yeah. Well, congratulations. Very, very good presentation. And you're right about the bureaucracy. It is so very real. And you have learned so fast. <laughs> and I want to officially welcome you to, the member of, to be a member of Club Fed, which is what we call it on the inside. My brother calls me a govy. Um, but yes, pretending as if it already works, I would say that has been the key to doing something new in a bureaucratic, a bureaucratic organization. I imagine it would work elsewhere, but you have really figured that out fast, and uh, thank you for sharing some of those insights, because I think those of us who are still kind of locked in it forget how we got there, and excellent presentation. Thanks, and thanks for forgiving my mistakes along the way. All right, well, thanks very much.